Well, good afternoon. My name is Hunter Oswald. I am the Student Fellow in Conservative Thought for the Institute. I have the honor of introducing our speaker this afternoon. Michael Medved hosts a daily talk sh radio show and podcast that combines politics, pop culture, history, and values. He is also a New York Times bestselling author of 14 nonfiction books, most recently The American Miracle, Divine Providence in the Rise of the Republic, and its follow-up, God's Hand on America, Divine Providence in the Modern Era. In his in this series, Michael describes astonishing incidents in which luck, nature, or some higher power seems to intervene on behalf of the United States. An honors graduate of Yale, he also attended law, Yale Law School and, well, has worked as both a political speechwriter and Hollywood screenwriter. He's a member of USA Today's Board of Contributors, and his pieces appear frequently in the Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, and Commentary. Michael has lectured for religious, political, and academic audiences in all 50 states and six Canadian provinces. As an active leader in the Jewish community, Ma uh, Michael has served as president of an, of an Orthodox synagogue and co-founder of a Jewish day school. His lectures to Jewish communities frequently discuss the historic connection between America and Israel, the revival of Orthodox Judaism, and, and the sometimes tortured relation between Jews and entertainment industry. He has, he's been married to Dr. Diane Mivid, clinical psychologist and best-selling author for 37 years, and they are the parents of three grown children and grandparents of the five most remarkable grandchildren of God's green earth. <laughs> Without further delay, welcome Michael Medved. Thank you, and I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be back at Grove City College. I mean, uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, I think, my 10th trip, uh, and having started coming to these wonderful conferences that uh, were put together initially by Lee Wishing, and uh, who's here, uh, it's just been a, a highlight of uh, my years, and now that we're done with COVID, thank God, uh, it's great to be here. Now that's despite the fact that the great speech that we just heard from the former vice president um, absolutely stole my opening for, I, I mean, just stole it. I was gonna begin with a good question for you. What's your favorite Bible verse? And, you know, I thought people would raise hands and uh, because this was a, a question that was asked to President Trump when he was campaigning in 2016 uh, at Liberty University. And um, he said, well, I, I don't have a favorite one. I just love them all. They're all wonderful. And I was thinking about some of the verses that we go through in uh, our Torah readings every week about sacrifices. Th those are tough. Those are tough. But my favorite Bible verse is the one that... Uh, that uh, Mike Pence mentioned and quoted uh, just now. And basically, it's uh, about the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham, and it's about the subject of my speech today, the uh, Abrahamic advantage. And what God says to Abraham in uh, in, in the book of Genesis, it's uh, chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. What he says uh, first, leading up to saying, uh, go for yourself from your land, from your relatives, and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And then the Almighty says, and I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And then the climax, he says, I will bless those who bless you, and him who curses you I will curse. And all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. Now, again, that's a remarkable prophecy, but it's impossible to understand America's special blessing without understanding how that prophecy works. Uh, I know we're talking about anti-Semitism today, but there has been no nation on earth where Jews have lived uh, that has been as free of anti-Semitism, and everything is relative. 
That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist here. It doesn't mean that you still have some idiots who practice it, some evil people who harbor anti-Semitic ideas. But the United States of America stands out among all the nations of the world, and it stands out with the blessings that this country has received. Uh, in my book, The American Miracle, I, I, I quote the very significant statement by the Iron Chancellor of Germany, who created the modern state of Germany, Otto von Bismarck. And, and Bismarck said, uh, God has a special protection for lost dogs, idiot children, uh, drunkards, and the United States of America. <laughs> And uh, again, he's not suggesting that the United States of America is drunk or idiotic or lost, but that somehow this country has received from Providence extraordinarily favorable treatment. And part of that was also mentioned in, uh, in Mike Pence's speech today, I want to speak a little bit about three presidents, one of whom was mentioned by uh, President Washington, by Mike Pence, and uh, three private citizens whose uh, stories, very briefly, can illustrate the uh, point about this Abrahamic advantage that America has enjoyed by blessing the Jewish people who started coming to this country only in any really significant numbers uh, in the 1840s, originally from Germany, and then in much more significant numbers in the 1880s through 1924 from Eastern Europe. But Governor, uh, President Washington, when he first became president under the Constitution in 1790, he not only wrote that famous letter that Mike Pence quoted uh, to the Newport Hebrew congregation, a, uh, a letter that actually had biblical resonance, he sent another even more remarkable letter. See, on this one I can make up for the fact that Pence used it. Um, he sent an even more remarkable letter to the uh, Jewish congregation, which was a struggling congregation in Savannah, Georgia. And he wrote, this is the President of the United States. May the same wonder-working deity who long since delivering the Hebrews from their Egyptian oppressors, planted them in the promised land, whose providential agency has lately been conspicuous in establishing these United States as an independent nation, still continue to water them with the dews of heaven and to make the inhabitants of every denomination participate in the temporal and spiritual blessings of that people whose God is Jehovah. And that is a fundamental difference from everything else you had heard, even from British friends of the Jews. Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans were friends of the Jews. They wanted to end the expulsion that had been begun in the 12th century. The Jews were expelled from Britain because of the uh, blood libel and were not allowed to even come back and live in Britain at the time of Shakespeare, no Jews in Britain. That's how he could write about Shylock and placed him in Venice. But uh, here in the United States, it wasn't a question of tolerance, of allowing Jews. It was a question of welcoming Jews. And now that we've dealt with President Washington, uh, which president do you think said this, writing to the most famous Jew in America at that time, assuring him of his respect and esteem uh, and then this former president at the time said, I could find it in my heart to wish that you had been at the head of 100,000 Israelites, indeed as well disciplined as the French army, and marching with them into Judea and making a conquest of that country and restoring your nation to the dominion of it, for I really wish the Jews again in Judea an independent nation. You know which president said that? I'll give you a hint. He uh, said it in 1819. Isn't that amazing? That's 1819. You're talking about 100 years 
uh, before the Balfour Declaration. You're talking like long before the modern Zionist movement, long before Theodor Herzl. It's John Adams, the Atlas of Independence, our second president, who also wrote 11 years earlier, this being in 1808, uh, Adams said, I will insist that the Hebrews have done more to civilize men than any other nation. If I were an atheist and believed in blind eternal fate, I should still believe that fate had ordained the Jews to be the most essential instrument for civilizing the nations. They are the most glorious nation that ever inhabited this earth. Okay, that's a former president, uh, a Christian, a man of faith, who obviously took that Genesis 12 passage very, very seriously. Now, that letter about, I wish I could see you marching at the head of an army of hundreds of thousands of Israelites, that was addressed to the most famous Jew in America at the time, whose name was uh, Mordechai Manuel Noah. And what a character. He was a, a journalist, a playwright, a politician. He was the first uh, Jewish American to be appointed to a federal office. He was our ambassador to Tunis, to the court of Tunisia in North Africa. And he became obsessed with this idea of establishing a refuge for battered and persecuted Jewish people here in the United States, where in Grand Island in the Niagara River near Buffalo. It was a wrong place. Uh, but. <laughs> In any event, his idea was he was going to get Jews from all over the world to come there and then prepare for this invasion to liberate the Holy Land and to reestablish the state of, or to reestablish the Commonwealth of Judea, to make it once again uh, the center of the Jewish world. He, he never got very far. If you go to Grand Island, I have, in the Niagara River, they have a big stone uh, that announces the beginning of this new uh, venture, which was called Ararat. Why Ararat, biblical scholars? Because his name was Noah, Mordechai Manuel Noah, and Ararat is where Noah ended up, on the top of Mount Ararat in Turkey. In any event, they have this big monument to him where they name him as the, council, as the governor general of the new state of Judea. Uh, didn't really work out too much. But there was another individual in that same period of time who went further. And I mentioned we are talking about three individuals, three presidents. The uh, individual who went further was someone I will bet no one here has ever heard of, but you should. His name was Warder Cresson. That's C-R-E-S-S-O-N. He was the first ever American Consul General to Jerusalem. How did that happen? Warder Cresson was raised Quaker. He came from a wealthy family around Philadelphia. A lot of the property around Chestnut Street, which if people know Center City, Philadelphia, is the very heart of the city, that was owned by the Cresson family. And he was a religious explorer, raised Quaker, he also then became a Mormon early on, one of the earlier followers of Joseph Smith. He then became a Shaker. He didn't like that because that involved no sexuality. And uh, he had six children, so uh, he clearly couldn't follow the uh, Shaker teachings. He became a Campbellite and a Baptist, and then he became transfixed with this idea of rebuilding Jerusalem and reestablishing a Jewish commonwealth in, in uh, the Middle East. And part of the reason for that is he was taken with the symbolism of the American eagle. And in the book of Isaiah and in several other prophetic books, there are prophecies that God will bring the Jewish people back to Israel on the wings of eagles. Yeah, that means America to Warder Crescent. So he wrote a letter to the Secretary of State, who at the time was John C. Calhoun. And he wrote to Secretary Calhoun and said, uh, look, you have no office, no ambassador in Jerusalem. I will pay for all the expenses, because he was a very wealthy man, 
uh, and go as the consul in Jerusalem to help all of the religious pilgrims who come there, particularly Christians, particularly Americans. And Calhoun said, Ed, how much did you say this was going to cost the government? He said, nothing. I'll pay for it all. He said, you got a deal. So uh, he took off uh, and starts heading, and he wanted to meet with a group of leading rabbis in London before he got to Israel. But his whole purpose of going to Israel was to try to rebuild this Jewish commonwealth. And again, at the time he came, I think it was during his brief stay with the Baptist faith, but he had been all over the map religiously. And he also wanted to, he landed in Jaffa, he landed with an American flag in one hand, waded ashore, and a dove of peace in a cage in the other hand, uh, because he was going to rebuild Jerusalem, which was a pretty rundown, shabby place, a total population of 15,000 at the time. This is 1844. And uh, it, it was at a time when half that population of 15,000 was Jewish. In any event, Warder Cresson uh, met with visiting dignitaries, and, and by the way, when he had been appointed consul, a number of people from Pennsylvania wrote to the Secretary of State John C. Calhoun and to President Tyler, no, you can't appoint this guy, he's nuts. <laughs> he's somebody who goes to church doors and he has an Old Testament beard and he shouts and he shouts and he talks about the rebuilt Jerusalem. And so Calhoun uh, wrote him a letter and said, uh, okay, you're no longer the official consul. And he said, that's okay. I'm here at my own expense. And he continued his service. Okay, th the story is just incredibly complicated. He predicted the Holocaust and he is the first person ever to use the term Holocaust in a pamphlet that he wrote in 1850. That's a, a long in advance. And uh, then one of the things that was uh, remarkable about Cresson was, and I, I should read it to you the way he wrote it in his diary, is during his time in uh, what at that time was called often Judea. It was not called Palestine yet. But uh, by the way, he says, I remained in Jerusalem in my former faith until the 28th day of March, 1848, he wrote, when I became fully satisfied that I never could obtain strength and rest, but by doing as Ruth did and saying to her mother-in-law, or Naomi, entreat me not to leave thee, for whither thou goest, I will go. In short, I was circumcised on that day, entered the Holy Covenant, and became a Jew. And he became a, a serious and engaged Jew, announced this back to his wife at home with their six children. Uh, she didn't like any of it. And using uh, a, 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 a facet of the law in Pennsylvania, uh, she claimed title to all of the property that was supporting this mission to Jerusalem, which seemed so very bizarre. And. Uh, uh, and then he came home and challenged it. And there was a trial. And the trial became a national sensation. And the idea being, OK, this guy was admittedly a strange bird, as his lawyer uh, held it. But was he insane, and so insane that his wife should take all their property? The trial lasted three years. They had over 100 witnesses, including distinguished religious leaders, rabbis, Ralph Waldo Emerson testified, uh, and, and it ended with a total victory for, uh, for Warder Crescent. And uh, the, uh, the judge in the uh, judgment said, this case will set forever the principle that a man's religious opinions never can be made the test of his sanity. <laughs> which is fascinating. In any event, Cresson came back to Israel. He, uh, he spent some time with Herman Melville, who was very upset because he had written a long novel that was a complete flop called Moby Dick. And uh, so he came to Israel to try to renew his faith. 
and he stayed with Crescent, and they argued, and Melville wrote down their arguments. And at this point in his life, Cresson was obsessed with scientific agriculture. He had been a farmer, he had owned farmland in Pennsylvania. And so he wanted to use scientific farming to get the Jews to be farmers again. And he died just before the Civil War. He felt that if America worked to get Jews back to the Holy Land, it would prevent the Civil War from happening. He, uh, he was diagnosed with an unknown malady. This is after he had uh, the divorce had gone through with his wife. He had married a Jewish woman, had two Jewish children. He changed his name to Mikhail, uh, which is my name too, Mikhail. Uh, Mikhail Boaz Aaron uh, uh, Ben Avraham. Is, uh, and in any event, he uh, was, was buried with 10,000 people attending his funeral because he had become such a beloved figure in, uh, in Israel. And people now recognize him because of his pioneering idea about collective farms, about people using farmland, renewing the farmland, making uh, Israel, Judea, and Samaria included a productive agricultural power again. Uh, Israel is one of the biggest agricultural exporters affiliated with the European Union. But in any event, what's interesting to me, and one of the reasons I became interested in this, is that he, um, he owned the land and he was trying to arrange it into one of these farms in what's called neighborhood of Jerusalem today, which is called Emek Rafaim, which is Valley of the Healers, is one translation. That's where my brother lives today in Jerusalem, and um, they recently discovered his gravesite on the Mount of Olives and trying to rescue this unknown eccentric from the history, for, from the history books, uh, they uh, reestablished his gravestone on the Mount of Olives. Okay, uh, when you deal with um, Warder Crescent, there's uh, another uh, individual, private citizen, who is worth mentioning, who was consumed, an American Jewess, as she is called, she was consumed with the idea of, again, returning Jews to ancient glory. And her name was Emma Lazarus. Now, you probably know her name uh, because of her, um, uh, her uh, authorship of the poem that is on the base of the Statue of Liberty. She, she actually won a contest with that. She donated that. She was a, a wealthy uh, family and mercantile Sephardic Jewish family. And she became an, an acclaimed poet and uh, translated in particular uh, some of the works from German, from French, and from Hebrew. She translated the works of Yehuda Halevi, who also was a medieval Spanish rabbi who yearned to return to Jerusalem and again to see the fulfillment of the biblical prophecies we've been talking about. And she uh, wrote a poem called Wake Israel. Wake Israel, wake, recall today the glorious Maccabean rage. Oh, for Jerusalem's trumpet now, to blow a blast of shattering power, to wake the sleepers high and low, and rouse them to the urgent hour. Uh, this was also a period of time in uh, the 1870s and 80s when mass immigration of Jewish people from Eastern Europe was beginning, and it was beginning because of turmoil in the, uh, Russia, because of the assassination of the Jar and Jews being blamed for it and literally more than two million uh, Russian Jews, including my grandparents, uh, were forced out of Russia and, and came to the United States. And it was, uh, she became very involved with uh, uh, charitable services to try to help those refugees and to get them to Israel. And uh, again, it's, it's worth just for a moment. She died at age 37, uh, tragically, of uh, uh, cancer. 
And uh, her, her greatest poem, The New Colossus, not like the brazen giant of Greek fame with conquering limbs astride from land to lands, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with a torch whose flame is the imprisoned lightning and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome, her wild, mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor, the Twin Cities frame. Brooklyn was a separate city at that time, framed by Brooklyn and New York. Keep ancient lands, your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuge of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest toss to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Somebody else in the last figure that I want to speak about who believed in the golden door of uh, America was uh, uh, someone named William Eugene Blackstone. Anyone know anything about W. E. Blackstone. And again, he wrote one of the best-selling books of the entire 19th century. He had no formal education, but he was a brilliant guy and a wonderful writer. He wrote a book in 1878. It sold a million copies, which in 1878 is unbelievable because books are relatively expensive. The book was called Jesus is Coming. And chapter 15 of the book was all about to prepare for the coming of Jesus, getting the Jews back to where they belong. In other words, with all of what we've been hearing about anti-Semitism, what we see here is people like uh, William Eugene Blackstone, who became hugely famous, and he wrote something called the Blackstone Memorial, which is, which is truly, when you read it, it is, it is just astonishing because the Blackstone Memorial was a letter to the President of the United States at that time, who was Benjamin Harrison. And the, the whole point of his letter that he said is, um, he said, Israel to be restored. The resulting Blackstone Memorial that he put together with a, a group of rabbis and leading clergymen and leading politicians, amazingly enough, the Blackstone Memorial won the endorsement of 437 distinguished and very well-known Americans, including figures of truly dazzling power and prominence. You ever heard of John D. Rockefeller? Yes, of course. He signed it, as did J.P. Morgan, Cyrus McCormick Jr., and Charles Scribner II, Chief Justice of the United States, Melville Fuller attached his name, along with the Speaker of the House, Thomas Brackett Reed of Maine, the future President, William McKinley, and the mayors of Philadelphia and Chicago, editors of 93 newspapers also pledged their support to Blackstone's cause, representing all the major publications in Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and Chicago. Uh, and um, he, he accompanied this Blackstone Memorial demanding that the President and the Secretary of State, James Gillespie Blaine, use American military power to uh, help oppressed Russian Jews come back to Israel. And he wrote in a personal note to the president, not for 24 centuries since the days of Cyrus, the king of Persia, has there been offered to any mortal such a privileged opportunity to further the purposes of God concerning his ancient people. May it be the high privilege of your excellency and the honorable secretary to take a personal interest in this great matter and secure through the conference a home for these wandering millions of Israel and thereby receive to yourselves the promise of him who said to Abraham, I will bless them that bless thee. Uh, the president did mention the cause of a new Israel briefly in uh, the State of the Union, but <laughs> like other presidents and other promises, uh, never went anywhere. But Blackstone did. He continued on this issue. He continued to be a famous Christian leader. He was the founding dean of Biola University, which is the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. 
and he lived to 94. And before he died, a justice of the Supreme Court named Louis D. Brandeis, the first American Jew appointed to the Supreme Court. And Brandeis wrote to him and said, you are the true father of Zionism because you predated Herzl by a full generation. And he did. And uh, Blackstone wrote back to Louis Brandeis and said, uh, I sent to Mr. Herzl a copy, my copy of the Bible with all of the items underlined and notated that talk about the Jewish return to the Holy Land. And Herzl said that he, during his brief life, Herzl died at age 44, he kept a copy of this Bible from this Christian American leader on his desk. Okay, finally, I mentioned three private citizens and three presidents. The final president, of course, is Harry Truman. We saw him briefly in uh, that clip there. Uh, Harry Truman, after he left the presidency uh, in 1953, uh, shortly thereafter, his former business partner, Eddie Jacobson, who was Jewish, who had fought with him in World War I, they had had a failed haberdashery store in Independence, Missouri after that. But Eddie Jacobson got uh, his buddy, the former president, Harry Truman, to speak uh, to the, uh, a group of distinguished Jewish scholars at Jewish Theological Seminary in New York. And uh, he introduced Truman by saying, and this is my friend uh, uh, and your former president, uh, a man without whom the state of Israel might never exist, Harry Truman. And they applauded. Truman stood up. He said, Eddie, what do you mean may not have existed? He says, I am Cyrus. I am Cyrus. Uh, both times because Cyrus, the Persian emperor, had allowed the exiled Jews of Babylonia to return and to build the second temple. Now, where does all this go? Where all of this goes is the idea that, yes, anti-Semitism is a plague, it's a disease, it exists everywhere, but in the United States, it has been so overwhelmed by not the causeless hatred of Jewish people, but the welcoming and support and sympathy for the Jewish people, and support without which, well, as Truman said, I am Cyrus, I am Cyrus. And this goes back very far, and I want to conclude with just a couple of more um, uh, statements that are historic statements that show you how far back this goes and how deeply it's entwined with America's destiny and sense of destiny and the whole idea of America's purpose in the world. In 1798, uh, right after the creation of the new nation under the Constitution, 1789, in 1798, there's a guy named Elias Bodino, who was a former president of the Continental Congress. In other words, he was a former president of the Continental Congress before the Constitution, and he was the founder of the American Bible Society. And he wrote, America has been greatly favored by God in all her concerns both civil and religious. She has been raised up in the course of divine providence at a very important crisis and for no very inconsiderable purposes. She stands on a pinnacle. She cannot act a trifling or undecided part. Who knows? But God has raised up these United States in these latter days for the very purpose of accomplishing his will in bringing his beloved people to their own land. This is a hundred years before Theodore Herzl convened the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland. It is uh, clearly part of American destiny and part of a unique strain of American history to so all of these prominent people, and really incredibly prominent, powerful people who are not anti-Semitic, they're philo-Semitic. They're people who have welcomed my people, helped us, 
and help to realize this dream of a reborn Israel. I think I mentioned to you uh, that Herman Melville came and spent some time <laughs> with Warder Cresson, and uh, he recorded their correspondence because he thought that Warder Cresson was mad, but he thought he was some kind of a mad genius. And to conclude, uh, to make up for the sting of Moby Dick being such a commercial failure, to conclude with uh, a, a, another passage from Herman Melville. In 1850, he wrote a novel, White Jacket. And in White Jacket, he wrote this. He wrote, um, the Israel of our time is the United States of America, destined for its own mosaic mission. Escaped from the house of bondage, Israel of old did not follow after the ways of the Egyptians. To her was given an express dispensation. To her were given new things under the sun. And we Americans are the peculiar chosen people, the Israel of our time. We bear the ark of the liberties of the world. God has predestinated, mankind expects great things from our race and great things we feel in our souls. The rest of the nations must soon be in our rear. We are the pioneers of the world, the advance guard, sent on through the wilderness of untried things to break a new path in the new world that is ours. May we continue to break that path. Uh, may we continue to receive the blessings uh, that are related to our blessing of the people of Israel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have time for a couple of questions? Good. Uh, and by the way, if the question is, so how does it all turn out? <laughs> Read the book. <laughs> President Biden was so forceful in his remarks after, in the days right after the Hamas attacks, uh, but we continue to see a weakening of that. Um, is that just because of the campaign, or is he uh, crumbling under pressure from some of these demonstrations uh, across the nation? I don't think the demonstrations uh, uh, impact him. What impacts him is the divisions within his party. When in the state of Michigan, which Biden really has to win if he's going to win the presidency, in the state of Michigan they had I think over a hundred thousand people who voted for an uncommitted slate to try to show how angry they were uh, against Biden because of his support for Israel. Look, um, I, I don't, I don't know what the president's motivations are. The one thing that I do know is that um, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, is Jewish. And his stepfather was a Holocaust survivor. And if you listen to the Secretary of State, he has been clear and relatively forceful. Uh, I. I I think that one of the things that you hear from Israelis, and, and my brother's been an Israeli for 40 years. He went on Aliyah years ago. He has 14 Israeli-born grandchildren, and, uh, and he's younger than me. Uh, but it, in any event, uh, the one thing that he has always been concerned about is Israel becoming a partisan issue. And this is one of those things is that uh, may the Secretary of State and the President and the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin, and others in the Biden administration have the strength to resist the idiocy and filth coming out of people like uh, Ilan Omar and Rashida Tlaib and uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, despite the fact that he's Jewish, and, and other uh, Jew haters, and I think some of them are, not necessarily Bernie Sanders, uh, and, and, and their positions. And, uh, it's extraordinarily important that uh, Israel receive not only the strong support from the Republican Party, which it has, but, uh, but, but also uh, enough support from, from Democrats to keep the promised aid flowing. 
Unfortunately, yes. due to time, we only have time for one more question. I'll tell you what, could, could, I, could I do, I'll do two and I'll answer them, in other words, do two questions and then I'll answer them one, two, quickly. Thank you for the fascinating historical material. Uh, I was curious about the, like the Northern Hemisphere anti-Semitism, the roots are sort of the Christian, and we go back to the way they interpret the Bible and anti-Jewish. Um, what about the Southern Hemisphere anti-Semitism, um, or maybe among the Muslims or, or people who view the Israelis as colonists uh, part of the great so. great question well, let me get to that in a moment the last question so um, thank you for for that wonderful reminder of our our heritage the, the United States has been seen as the the golden Medina for the Jewish people and I think a lot of people are starting to question that, whether that age is ending. Is that age ending of safety for, the, for, for Jews in the United States? Um, and what can we do to continue to make the United States a welcoming place for our Jewish neighbors? Great questions, both of them. Uh, first of all, on this question about the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere, one of the things that I, I think that uh, people have not spoken about at this conference, but it's incredibly important. It is what they say when you're studying Talmud and you're looking for the essential element, that one key that gives everything away. This is it. Uh, that's a phrase, ikerzach. You're looking for the, the, the really key to understanding. Is that a great deal of the anti-Semitism that we get today, particularly from the left, but also to some extent from the right, is not because Jews have come here and have become uh, people who collect welfare and people who uh, are pathetic and are losers. It's because Jews have been so successful. And there is a, almost a religion on the left that being an underdog, being a victim, is sacred. And, uh, and that is why one of the reasons uh, that people who are on the left so much in the Southern Hemisphere uh, have a resentment of Jews because Jews have been successful. By the way, there's some of that same hatred at attracted by Asian people, a Asian immigrants to the United States recently. But it's very hard for people to look at the representation of Jews at, at, uh, at Harvard and at Yale and uh, at Columbia and at, and at Grove City College and at leading universities around the, the country and to uh, assume that this people uh, is still victimized and still depressed. And it's one of the reasons I, I actually believe that uh, uh, Jews should not catch on to this. In other words, if, if we try to pretend that we are victims, we are not. Uh, the anti-Semitism that is a factor in American life is ugly. It can be deadly, as we found out in Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh uh, recently. But it is exceedingly rare compared to the number of people who have sympathy and support for Jewish people. And for your question about continuing our, uh, our status as the Goldena Medina, Golden Medina is a Yiddish phrase. Goldena means golden, obviously, and a Medina is a province or a, uh, so we, we were viewed as the golden province that our grandparents and great-grandparents could come to. And I, I honestly, I think that the, the all, and this comes from both the left and the right, the claims that America is about to die, that if, if this one candidate doesn't win the election, it will be the end. There'll be no more America. And it makes me sick, frankly. You hear that from both the Biden side and the Trump side. Uh, the, Adam Smith, uh, not Jewish, but a very great economist and thinker, um, once said uh, there's a great deal of destruction in a nation, meaning 
that it's not so easy for a country that has been built up with all of the blessings that we enjoy, these unbelievable lives that we enjoy, there are probably people in this audience who know people who, in your family, who were the first to go to college, period. I mean, we have so many choices in, in the United States. And uh, I, I, I do not believe that we are close to a communist takeover or a fascist takeover or a Nazi takeover or takeover of any kind. Uh, we have two flawed candidates for president running right now. But the idea that the survival of this great nation, the nation that uh, President Lincoln used that phrase, which, uh, uh, by the way, was also that America was almost a chosen people. And the reason he didn't say we were a chosen people was because we hadn't yet gotten rid of the massive evil of slavery. Uh, to have survived what we have survived and to continue to offer the blessed and, and favorable lives that we all enjoy, uh, I think should encourage us all. And frankly, the idea of uh, claiming hysteria, claiming apocalypse, claiming approaching breakdown, I just saw a movie that I do not recommend. It's called Civil War. It opens on Friday. Don't see it. Uh, it's about a putative civil war involving the United States. But uh, look, we, we go out there, it's April, uh, it's Pennsylvania. Uh, we, we do live in the greatest nation ever. And to conclude with a, a final quote from Bismarck, uh, again, who uh, says it is the job of any great statesman to listen for God's footsteps in history, and then to grab his cloak and hold on. We need to hold on. Thank you so much, and I look forward to a wonderful conference.